So today for Gaul's Question Time, I've got the pleasure of being joined by uh, JP Curdo. Hi, JP. Andrew, how are you? Good, good. Good to have you here with us. Um, we got connected through Green Angel Syndicate, or now called Green Angel Ventures. Uh, I've a, been a member, active member, and you've been a venture that's been through being invested by Green Angel Syndicate. That's right, isn't it? Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. Yeah, great. So um, what I'd like to talk with you today is the journey of being an entrepreneur, really. You've been through one venture, uh, you're onto your, you're onto another one on that now. But I think that whole journey of being an entrepreneur and starting a venture and exiting. So it'd be great to get that story if you kick off an introduction to yourself. Yes, absolutely, Andrew. So thank you very much for having me today. Very, very exciting. Um, yeah, so I've been um, uh, life as an entrepreneur. Um, but before that, I was um, on the corporate side. So I used to work for companies like BP, Shell, Eden F. Mann. Um, I was at Shell Gas when it got bought by Orsted. And that was my first um, introduction to renewables. And I've been going through various different commodities from sugar and coffee to natural gas, electricity, renewables, et cetera, et cetera. So all in the physical commodity side. Um, and then I decided to leave the, um, the corporate world and venture into the, um, into the unknown, into the startup world. Um, so my, 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 first, my first venture or my first company was a consultancy. So while I was at, at, at Orsted, I got introduced into power purchase agreements. And at the time, um, it was only Google and Amazon, um, perhaps maybe even Microsoft, signing these deals. And we're talking about probably 13 years ago. Wow. And I, I, I found the concept fascinating. And I decided to you know, venture into starting a, a small boutique consultancy that basically allowed smaller companies to access power purchase agreements, you know, in the same way that your Googles and Microsoft were accessing them. Because I thought, you know, this is a very impactful way to actually, you know, deploy fossil fuels and turn them into green electrons and build new assets. You know, the, the helping to build new assets was, was something that really, really attract, attracted me. So, my first venture I, I built with um, with no investment. Um, I, I didn't even know that I could really get any investment. So, um, so just, and I built on, team... JP, just, to, just to explain for ones who don't know, and I don't know really, so what's a purchasing power agreement? Why, why would these large companies or smaller companies want to buy through some sort of agreement as opposed to just go into their local power provider and say, just give me your electricity or sell me at the cheapest price what what are they purchasing that's different that you were advising on that's a really really good question so um a power purchase agreement itself is a very long-term contract it's essentially a contract between yourself as a corporate and the generate the generator directly so the company that builds these wind and solar farms and you commit to offtake the energy from that specific project over a period of time. So probably 12 to 15 years is now the the, the standard um, term. Um, and, and the impactful thing about power purchase agreements is that you allow the developer to get the necessary finance to build the asset, right? So, right. you know, the, the developer goes to the bank and says, you know, I've got this off taker, um, lend me the money to build the asset. And directly you are deploying fossil fuels and replacing them with a brand new project um, to your name, essentially. And, and that's really impactful. And you as a corporate, that's the kind of gold, gold standard at the moment. So if you sign up to um, um, an initiative like RE100 or CDP and you set up your targets via that initiative, then the power purchase agreement is like the gold standard because you're actually supporting the development of new assets you know and, yeah. and, and that's super impactful yeah no that you know that's really important isn't it because we're seeing now with climate impact and get to net zero and esg stuff 
we're, we're seeing that it could be pretty <clears throat> murky in terms of saying, oh, yeah, I'm going to offset. But there's maybe no extra capacity built and there's also there could be other stuff of that happening and that within that space and as you said that direct link between a company contracting and some new infrastructure put in place is so is so so important yes it's so important but it's also very very hard yeah um because it's it's quite chunky contract so you need to have quite a lot of volume you need to have you know amazing credit rating to be as a company to be attractive to these developers because okay, yeah. you know when they present the business case to the bank you know they need to make sure that you as a company will exist for the next 15 years or 16 20 years okay, right okay. um so that's why i i built my first um startup and even my second startup zygo was strongly focused on democratizing access access to renewables um, via these power purchase agreements. Great. Okay. So Zygo now, then you mentioned that. That's the business that that was your second or third iteration of getting into this from consultancy into the other bits. So how did it then come together to you to realize that this is an, an investable business? And how did you go about getting investors and scaling? The, the reason I realized this was a scalable business was on scalability basically so when i was um when i sold my first consultancy to south pole group um i we, we run a couple of tenders for some companies like virgin media and on the back of that tender we got quite a lot of projects right so basically developers at the time when demand wasn't that high were coming to us and saying you know these projects are not suitable for virgin media but you know these are amazing projects. Can you help us market these projects and find a, a good off taker? And we ended up with around 50 projects. And we were like, you know what? This is this is great. This is something that actually needs to, to, to happen. And, and corporates need to know about this project. And, um, you know, we need to promote this project. So that was the first iteration of, of Zygo. It was essentially a marketplace where we promoted these projects with corporates um in a digital way so we, we we thought about initially to send a, a newsletter to say you know these are the, the latest projects but then we thought actually it's not just the realizing that the project exists is actually going through the tendering process understanding what are the requirements to contract energy from this wind farm or solar farm and um, it's all the risks involved or the contract and all the stuff that you know comes with it Actually, maybe we can simplify this by making it um, digital. Right. Okay. No, that's good. That's good. Yeah, and I think actually you're you're sparking something here with me now in that what what I've been saying for quite a few years that we've got to think about new value chains. We've got to think about new business processes when we're doing some of these things. And they, and this is not just it's not just changing the power station or the power source. What you've talked about there is you realize with the engagement that you needed to change the process and you needed a platform to be able sort of to do this. And it's changing that business model. It's not just about changing to a solar farm. As you said, there's a whole bits you've got to get right with you know, the finance and the process and connecting the right partners and that. Okay. Now good. That's yeah. good insight. <clears throat> yeah, correct. And, and, it's it's all about democratizing access because you know at, at at the time there was a few power purchase agreements being signed by Amazon and Google and and these guys have big teams right that can look yeah. at the legal side they, they can they understand power they understand markets they understand hedging they understand you know virtual BPAs they understand all these concepts that perhaps eighty percent or ninety percent of the rest of the companies don't right so. It's all about simplifying the model and simplifying the concept and making it a lot more accessible so that companies feel comfortable going through the process themselves. Okay. So in the go, go back to the early days of Zygo then, when you've now got these potential customers, you've got the idea of the process. How did you go about getting investors like Green Angel, Syndicate Angels and and the others who were in, in the early days of your business? Well, by by bringing so the, the the first um 
venture that got interested in us is Sustainable Ventures. And they have this great accelerator where, you know, they support companies from understanding the environment, understanding the market, the total addressable market, in, in, you know, all these terms that come with investing. Um, and they invest in really, really early stages, really early stage companies. Um, so I essentially went through the accelerator and they knew Green Angel Syndicate and they um, introduced me to Green Angel Syndicate, Simon at the time, and we got on really well and, and they they co-invest quite a lot with their with their ventures. So that was the first ticket. Um, so we went through the accelerator and we got um, um, investment from Green Angel Syndicate and Sustainable right. Ventures. And then through the through the program, they prepare you to um, go th through the next rounds and they look at your pitch, they look at your finance projections, you know, the, the whole package. Um, and that was really, really helpful because at the time that was my kind of first real investment venture, um, investment back venture. So it was great to bring a little bit more structure to my pitch and to, you know, the, the, what problem we were solving and, and all the yeah. stuff that comes with that. And yeah, and was Andrew Wordsworth your one of your key contacts? Yeah, 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 Andrew. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah I've known I've known Andrew for many years, and Sustainable Ventures, and that as well. I've really admire and recommend them to others who are looking at uh, you know sustainability and, and climate sort of change <laughs> side. And, and I know that they've worked well with the Green Angel Syndicate and that that as well. Yeah. So yeah, that's a that's a good example of synergy there within that that ecosystem, which is which is excellent. So the, the, the journey of the entrepreneur, you had the idea, you got some early sales, you saw the market sort of fit, you got your early angel investments. About when, what, what sort of timing was that now? In the, what, what year was that that you sort of were, were coming out of the accelerator and getting that early angel investment for Zyga? That was around 2020, 2021. Okay. Um, so we just raised our pre-seed we were and seed round we were actually raising a seed extension um and then obviously covid hit so yeah. that was um that was a very interesting time where you know we like changed the status quo completely and we were really worried about um the, the round and investment and you know all the VCs were actually worried about their portfolio and making yeah, sure yeah. that um, ensuring the survival of their own portfolios. Um, we were lucky enough to to raise capital through that as well because um, there were a few government backed initiatives that support the startups, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, right, um, yeah, but that that was a very challenging time for us for sure. Basically, the team went from being a very close team in the office seven days a week to being completely remote. We were figuring out, you know, how to accelerate the the growth of the company whilst figuring out how to survive COVID and yeah, make sure yeah. that we, we um, and we, we were hearing all these stories about, you know, a lot of companies failing and yeah, it, it was, it was a very interesting time. Um, but then that basically made the whole focus of renewables um like a lot more you know in in the front pages of, of everything right yeah, so the, the, yeah. there was like the, there was this initiative called um build back greener and um everyone just had a little bit of time to think about you know their footprint and how they can be more you know focused on being sustainable etc cetera, etc cetera. so that eventually helped us a lot um, yeah. The markets were a little bit fragile at the time, but yeah, we, we we managed to come fine on the other side. And in terms of the growth and that of the business, because yeah, I, I can see what you're doing now. You know what you built up <clears> as <throat> sort of platform could be quite disruptive, and that for the industry, or you're providing something new that I said the incumbents. You know, back to my first example of if I was a co corporate, I just go to my electricity provider and I try and find the cheapest and you're providing something quite different now. So how was that dynamic maybe starting to work with some of the incumbents as 
partners or competitors or sort of stuff like that and how, how are you seeing that that uh, how was that playing out um it was very very interesting so the in in terms of incumbents and competitors there was this um company in the us called level 10 um which their business model was very very similar to ours they were kind of digitizing ppas and making sure that um more companies had access um and then we realized that they were actually interested in the in the european market <clears throat> so so that actually was um um an opportunity for us to accelerate even further right because we knew that there was competition in the market we knew that um the in terms of demand demand was growing significantly yeah. more and more companies were actually joining these initiatives like re100 and cdp and and getting to understand a little bit more about ppas and the, the impact and this gold standard that we talk about. So it was a very interesting time because demand went from us trying to pitch the concept from scratch and, and two different concepts. So we were pitching the, you know, the concept of power purchase agreements and its complex complexities and, you know, how the, you know, in terms of impact. And the second pitch was our platform, right? So, you know, not we're not just pitching the, the concept of PPAs, but also pitching our platform, which simplifies PPAs and makes that um, a lot more easier to to access and and understand the the market and that kind of stuff. So right. it was it was it was quite quite an interesting time for sure. And, and certainly, I, I suppose as a as an entrepreneur, sometimes you know, and you get them pitched to angels. Oh, we're the only one, and sort of stuff like that. The, having a competitor coming into the market actually validates the market doesn't it and helps to and helps yeah. to get the whole concept and that sort of moving moving along so i think that's an important yeah. message to entrepreneurs and that out there as well that you know if you are the only one then that's maybe not such a good idea for investors or for the market <laughs> like as well so uh, so that's good so so in terms of your journey then you you then your exit journey because you know i think it's great to to listen to an entrepreneur that's then gone through the full the full gambit of as you said you're starting the idea and then getting your getting your seed and and growing so how, how did the exit come about and uh and, and the process of doing that as an entrepreneur yeah so we were raising our series a um and looking for investors and looking to um grow the company we had the plans um, and then we got approached by Schneider Electric and they were very clear from the very beginning. They were like, you know, we're not interested in investing, we're interested in acquiring, um, which to me at that stage was quite an attractive um, option because in, as, 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 an, as an entrepreneur, you want impact, right? Especially with, with, a, um, with an impact driven company. And you want that accelerant, you know, you want that um, company that will potentially, or that investor that will potentially come and change things and take it to the next level and take your idea to the next level. And not just the idea, but actually like the, the, the generic, the general concept. And, and that was something that um, Schneider was proposing there. They did exactly what we were doing, but in a non-digital way. Right. And they had a really, really strong focus on digitization and innovation um and we were quite a very we were an attractive option for them because we um we had that digital platform that um that was actually built and we had clients going through it and we had developers and we had projects and we had um transactions so for them it was quite an an, an exciting opportunity and for me and the team was a very exciting um, option as well because our all of a sudden you know Zygo could be uh, expanded into different countries and the, you know the idea could be accelerated and that kind of stuff which is exactly what they're doing now. Excellent, excellent. I think that's a good example. I think from say my experience over twenty years now, I've been working with large corporates and their corporate venture units and being an advocate for co to corporate saying look. These technologies are going to come. They're going to change. You need to embrace them. 
you need to change your business models to have impact, whether that's impact on climate, whether that's impact on health, whether that's impact in, in doing you know, good, good things for the planet and making money at the same time. I think you can't just be, oh, yeah, we're going to save the planet, but we haven't got a business model. So I think yeah. that, that's important. But getting corporates to understand that they, when they engage with startups, either by doing investing as corporate venturing so they get to to learn and, and change their processes, or as you're talking about here in Schneider Electric, recognizing what you're doing and acquiring, you know, your your know-how. I think that's great. You know, and I think you're right to put that you you rightly put it there. There's the software, there's the processes, there's the already the 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 customers, there's the team and sort of stuff like that. Because often people think, well, couldn't Schneider just get some coders and create the software? And it's it's not that, isn't it? What what they were acquiring with you was was broader than that. Is that fair? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And 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 this comes down to the the whole landscape um, of startups and investment and acquisitions right now. So it's it's not just the 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 idea, and it's not just the execution. It's kind of the whole package. So there's a lot of innovation out there. There's a lot of you know great startups doing great stuff. Um, and they always, you as a startup will always build your, your venture with exit in mind, right? So how can you grow this and how can it be useful to other companies and how the companies can benefit from your idea, right? And, and it'll be like, obviously you have two types of, of startups, ones that you grow and you want to continue growing and become one of these big corporates. Um, others, you basically focus on a niche, focus on a problem, and then basically like look for an exit and try to solve that problem further for, for a, um, a corporate that can actually accelerate your development. Um, and obviously there's other types of, of, of ventures, but those those two are the, are the main ones that, that we see yeah. right now. No, that's an excellent and, analogy. I think you've represented that really well because you know the, my next question was going to be around really well, why didn't you want to keep this going and grow it yourself and sort of stuff like that? And I, you know, I speak to so many entrepreneurs because I angel invest in a number of places and sort of stuff like that. And and you do get entrepreneurs who say, no, no, I'm going to keep growing this business. I'm going, to, no, the business model isn't right. You know, as you're saying. You know, this is the place you can have more impact by it being taken by a brand, be it by taken yeah. an operational, but by a global business where this thing can grow and have impact, as you were saying. <clears throat> so, so you didn't feel that, oh, I'm going to keep hold of Zygo and I'm going to grow it into the biggest platform or anything like that. Or was there tension for you or some of the team members or some of the investors to to say, no, it's too soon? Was there any view on that? Not at all, because we we fell into the second category of category of venture that I explained. Um, basically, and, and and this is quite interesting because you know you as a founder, when you set up your your startup, you have basically you want to eat the world in with one bite, right? You just want to do everything. You know, you, you think your startup can grow to magnificent proportions and you know, solve every problem possible. So one of one of my challenges was the, the pitching right at the beginning, right? Because we wanted to, whenever we spoke to a prospect and they were like, oh, can you do this as well? We were like, oh yeah, of course, of course we can do that as well. And then my, my first pitches were like, oh, actually we can do this and we can do that as well. And we do a little bit of this and there's some subscription for this and there's this other thing for that. And it just created confusion and, you know, until we actually decided, you know, actually, guys, we, we are a tendering platform for PPAs. That's it. That's what we're, we're a tendering engine and companies will come in here and the value proposition is we, we will run a tender for them and show them the best possible projects for them to sign a PPA with. And that's it. That's what we are, right? It, that was a time when we actually started growing um, the whole team was focusing on one thing rather than 10. Um, and then we, we started gaining a lot of traction because our um, 
value proposition was very clear. It was like, this is what we do. This is the this is what you're going to get. These are the, the, the deliverables. And that that concept and that platform fit really well into Schneider, for example, right? Because it was part of a bigger picture and a bigger infrastructure and Schneider could accelerate the platform and the company and et cetera, et cetera, um, with their current infrastructure, right? It, it, it wasn't for us to try to become the world biggest tendering platform in the world. So in, in that respect, it worked really well. For other, other startups and other founders, they look things differently, right? So they want to, you know, gain control and cover a specific yeah. market and a specific market segment. Um, but uh, for us, it was it was very natural that, um, you know, Schneider was the accelerant of what we were doing. Excellent. Great. So you had your successful exit from that and from for the investors and that. So, so what are you moving on to now as a serial entrepreneur? <laughs> So now, again, in the spirit of bringing transparency and to bringing a lot more visibility into the, the, the renewables market, now we're focusing on the certificate side, right? So basically, um, you as a developer, when you build a wind and solar farm, um, for every megawatt of power produced, you have to produce a certificate to that basically says, you know, I can confirm that the, the power, this megawatt of power came from this wind farm or this solar farm, right? Um, and it's up to you if you want to sell those certificates bundled with the energy, so as part of a package, um, or unbundled, because the, the certificates um, market is growing quite considerably and demand for certificates is growing. It's, it's similar to, to offsets. So, for example, if you're a company that um, signed a PPA for, I don't know, 40% of your volume, and you have remaining 60%, then it's quite challenging to find solutions for um, to actually trace back the energy to a specific wind and solar farm and basically like fit those energy certificates on an hourly basis to the times where you're actually consuming the power. Right. Um, so you know, transparency is is a big problem in the in the in the certificates market, and that's something we want to solve with renewable. Great. And what stage are you at with renewable in terms of your growth and investment and the key sort of metrics there for a startup? So we just closed our pre-seed round um, with some great investors. Um, and now, so now I have a co-founder. Um, so a guy called Nick that used to be the CEO of a company called WePower. And between us, we have a lot of experience within the renewables market, building platforms, understanding the traceability aspect using blockchain um, and basically the compliance bit with initiatives like CDP and RE100. So now we're in the process of building the, the platform, um, understanding the user experience, who are the key players, what are, what are the key needs in the market, and, and basically trying to solve those, those, those issues. Excellent. Excellent. JP, I think it's been fascinating talking with you getting the full story around uh, an entrepreneur going through all your early stages understanding how you get your first customers and i think that story of the you know the the empowering your team and, and you know, in, into the newer in, into the bigger parent i think is a is a great part of your story so wish you every amazing the next venture thank you very much Thank you, Andrew. Thank you very much. Please do like and subscribe to future interviews.